Good afternoon, after, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 113, Digitizing Tools on and Off Screen. Good afternoon, everybody. As you might know, it's been a day of false starts and some other difficulties going on, but we are going to press on with the show. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about digitizing tools on and off screen because I've been fielding a bunch of questions about digitizing setup and tools. And I know that there is certainly uh, a debate to be had about the kind of tools we use to digitize. And this is certainly the kind of stuff we can talk about in general for people who are uh, talking about art and digitizing and design. So there's stuff like that, our control schemes, our tools, our keyboards, our mice, our pen tablets, our tablet displays. We're gonna talk about that. But I'm also going to get a little bit into some non-standard uses for tools that I use inside the software, the on-screen tools, because we have a couple that uh, have come up from classes I've taught previously, some discussions about how I draw shapes, some discussions about uh, how I put things together, how I regularize fonts for one thing. We've talked about that as well as how to digitize for custom fonts, but we're talking about text, we're talking about geographic or geometric things, we're talking about uh, graphical representations and stuff that's going to be regular. There's some stuff we'll talk about with that, guidelines, things like that. So we're gonna talk about that all together. So starting out, a little bit about the debate, the pen versus mouse debate, the kinds of tools that I think work best for, di best for digitizing and uh, why I use the tools that I use. I I'm classically a mouse digitizer. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But there's pros and cons and reasons why we use these different tools. So going to talk certainly about some on-screen tools, but I would like to start with some off-screen tools. And I would love to hear more from you guys in the comments as to what tools you use and why. I'm actually going to show you some stuff online about tools that are available and discuss it and give you a little bit of a piece from one of my classes about that I call uh, debating digitizing about tools and workstation setup. I know we've talked a little bit about that before, but with these questions coming up over and over again, uh, I absolutely want to handle those and discuss those with you guys live, especially because I would love to hear some of your commentary about what you use when you choose to digitize. Uh, frankly, I'm going to say this right out of the gate that I have seen every person use every kind of tool a wide range of digitizers using pen tablets, using displays, using mice, and achieving the same kinds of results across the board. So the first thing is, before I say anything else, before I even say hi to anybody, in the debate where everybody's going to say, all right, mouse versus tablet, what is the debate about? Why do we do this? Why do we care? I know you've seen great digitizers using both. I know that there's lots of high-end artistic digitizers that use tablet displays. If you feel like that's the only way that you can digitize, it's not the only way. You do not need to invest in a high-end tablet display, a display that you can actually write on. We'll talk about these again in a second. A display that has a pressure-sensitive pen tablet, you do not need to invest in one to be a good digitizer. Almost the entirety of my career, I did not have one. Did I use pens? Yes, but I use pen tablets, not tablet displays. So they are awesome, they are great. I use them now more often than I used to but that is not the only way to be a good digitizer. There are great pros for why people use them. And I know that we're gonna get live in the comments about who likes what and why, but your ability to digitize embroidery, your ability to create designs that run well and look artistic and look lovely is not dependent entirely on your tools. It's more about your understanding of embroidery, your understanding of the tools in your software as well does play into it. It's about that and what works best for you. If you cannot start with that huge investment, if all you can do is afford your software and your computer and that's all you've got, hold off. Don't worry that that's the only way. Would, may you find it down the road, is it possible? Might you find that this is the thing that you like the best, that working on a tablet display or on a pen tablet suits you very well? Absolutely, there are lots of digitizers who have a tendency toward that as their primary mode and feel much more comfortable there. And that is awesome and good. And if you can afford those things out of the gate, awesome. If you can't, it doesn't mean that you're going to be completely barred from making good embroidery. So we're just gonna say that right out of the gate. It's a lot of new digitizers who come to me with this question. They see people using tablet displays and they feel like it's the only way. And I'm here to say it is not the only way to make good embroidery. And honestly, if you've seen pieces of mine that you think are fairly masterful, especially the ones from earlier on in my career, the likelihood is I made them either Mouse and keyboard, that is the highest likelihood for all of my pieces, even if they're naturalistic, even if they're super photographic. Mouse and keyboard was my primary mode and still is. Or with an off-screen tablet, 
that is just a pen tablet, not a tablet display. So if you think any of the pieces I've made are good that you've seen me show that are fairly detailed and fairly artistic, those were very likely done with a bog standard mouse. Heck, I will show you the mouse that I'm currently holding on to. Green screen's going to obliterate it, but like that is a travel mouse. And I still do a bunch of digitizing with a fairly middle of the road travel mouse. And that's fine. It's got decent optics. It's great. Do I like gaming peripherals and stuff that's a little better than that? Yeah, sometimes I do. But it, depending on where I'm sitting at any given time, I may just use the tools that are in front of me. And for a lot of that time, I'll be honest with you, back in the early days of wireless mice that weighed a ton, I would use a wired mouse over a wireless mouse because the weight would tire out your hands and your fingers after a time if you're doing a lot of precise work. So seriously, there are lots of reasons why people choose what they choose. But the very first thing out of the gate when we are talking about tools for digitizing is that mouse versus tablet isn't a good, good versus bad is not a better than others kind of method. It's not the thing. We're not going to make better embroidery specifically just because we chose the right input method. I'm just going to say that right out of the gate. People have different things that work best for them and honestly ergonomically best for them. It doesn't mean that one is going to make the best embroidery. And just like the software question, the digitizing comes from you. The artistic interpretation comes from you. I have seen just about every piece of software produce a masterpiece when there was a master sitting behind the computer. The problem we often has, have is the short between the chair and the keyboard. <laughs> That's the problem that we have. If there's a loose connection between the chair and the mouse, uh, that's us, then we were more likely to have problems, but not really the, it's not really the main thing that's going on. It usually isn't tools, usually isn't software. It's the understanding of embroidery. It's looking at different methods of mark making with thread, with stitches that makes the difference. So let's go ahead and say hi to some folks first and uh, grab some folks out, say hi, see what you guys are doing, what you're saying in the first kind of section of this. And then we'll get into uh, some of the mouse versus pen tablet reasons that we're going. And I'll actually talk about um, pen display versus pen tablet and some of the things that I think they're good for and some of the pros and cons. But first, let's say hi to some folks. That's why we do this. It's a live show. So embroidered print now. So this is Liliana. Thank you for giving me your name when you have your business name on your account. That helps. So uh, this is Liliana from Minnesota. Hi, Liliana. Happy to have you on. Jeff, who, by the way, Jeff Fuller of the Embroidery Nerd, he was on with me on the half on this channel. Go check out our discussion earlier this morning from the half, a half hour, really clean, really quick, a lot quicker than I usually am on this show. And it was a great episode. Great to have Jeff on. So thank you for that. Uh, Yosta is on from Sweden. Happy to have you on, Yosta. Frank is in from the UK. Looking forward to this one. Thank you, Frank. Looking forward to that too. And honestly, thank you for sharing and doing all you do. Frank is always out there sharing good resources, helping people out and making sure that education goes places. Uh, thank you, Frank, for being a great part of the community. Justin Armenta, digitizer, jadigitizing.com, doing great stuff with Embroidery Nerd. He says, happy Thread Education Day. Absolutely, Friday is Thread Education Day. Let's get it going. Uh, Marta says hi from Texas. Hi, Marta. Susan's in saying hi. Sally says good evening. Jeff Fuller says love. Hashtag thread education. Absolutely. <laughs> Ramona is already in with her vote. Ramona, who digitizes as well and has her own live show going uh, coming up. Ramona says pen. All right. Yeah. Some people are super pen people. I am, I am less of a pen person. I'll talk about that. Uh, Sally says me too. So she's on the pen route. Gosh, we're going to have a lot of pen folks. I might have to fight today. Got Frank in my corner. He says, mouse struggle with pen, right? And by the way, since we don't do dad jokes on here, I'm going to let Justin slide on this one. Justin says, how did you train the mice to digitize? Oh, oh man. How am I going to shake my head enough for that joke? Mm. I would face palm, but I got to be on the screen, my man. <laughs> how did you train the mice to digitize? Yeah, believe me, I wish I could train the mice. DJ says, hey, this is a great topic, does great education himself, and is a wonderful digitizer. Check out DJ stuff. But yeah, I agree. I think that this is a good topic because I continually have new people come up. They watch one of us. because I've, I've also got pictures of myself. I can show pictures of me digitizing on a, a pen display. Um, I have digitized with pen and on pen displays and the displays are awesome, but they're very expensive. Might not always be the way that everybody does it. We'll talk about that. Um, Justin says, I bounce back and forth between the, by the way, Wacom. I know this is a problem here. When people pronounce this, I had to look this up. Wacom. Wacom is the way to pronounce it. It's a Japanese company and the way that they spell things out, that's the pronunciation. I said Wacom through most of my career. I was told it's not, it is Wacom. 
believe me, that pronunciation is a thing. I didn't know that, but go look on the internet, go look at YouTube. And there are videos dating back like literally eight years from their channel talking about the pronunciation and all sorts of uh, graphic designers talking about it. He says, I bounce back and forth between the Wacom tablet uh, and traditional mouse depends on the design. That's me too. Uh, depends on the design. I think pros and cons, and we'll talk about that in a second. Depends on the genre of designs you do the most. And yes, I know I'm going to talk about it again, but I really feel like naturalistic designs, stuff that has a lot of manual stitches. If you're doing like animal work, that's a big one. Animal work, fur work, where you're working into existing stitches and drawing a lot of individual stitches in. Work that's really textural. Uh, you're doing, like I said, anytime you're doing a lot of manual work, you're drawing a lot of curves or naturalistic shapes that you don't have to be maybe quite as, uh, maybe quite as uh, you know, rectilinear, you're not on a grid, that kind of stuff. I'm happier to do that with pen tablet if it's natural. Uh, and honestly, I do sometimes use it for both. Sometimes it also is an ergonomic thing. We'll talk about that again in a second. If my wrist is sore, my fingers are sore from a certain position, I will switch between different mice and pen tablet because of that. That's another reason why you may switch to get different positions for your wrist and your arm, your shoulder. Depends on how that works for you. Um, but yeah, depending on the design, pretty huge. For me, it's about naturalistic stuff being a little easier to work into existing fills, existing uh, manual stitches and place my points exactly where I want them. Uh, pen display is great for that. We'll talk about that again in a second. The difference between pen tablet and pen display. Pen display is awesome for places where we work into existing stitching. What I mean by that, let me kind of define that for you. When we have stitching that is on screen and we're working into the spaces between the angles that are there, maybe doing a lot of shading or detail work on top of existing stitching and it matters where we place our, our, our points, our stitch penetration points, especially with manual work, I think that's really a fantastic place to use a pen display if you can. And I'll talk about some options that are out there now that I keep hearing people talk about. I'd love for you guys to kind of vote for your brand and I'll talk about what I've used. But yeah, it's something that that's where I more more have a tendency to use a pen display because pen display lets you really precisely kind of drop those points where you want them. Though I find that it's a little harder for me to hold uh, straight lines. I'm certainly using like key, com key commands and stuff to help with uh, holding down, like reducing my angles or holding things down to straight lines. But I find geometric work, uh, fonts especially, or some logo work, I'm, I'm personally more comfortable with the mouse, but part of that is also just muscle memory. What you start on is sometimes what you stay on. Uh, that's the that's the truth. When I see people who start with pen, they have a lot of trouble going back to mouse or going to mouse as a as a way of working. And believe it or not, there are people here. And if you do this, I am not saying something bad about your work. There are people probably here who use trackpad. If you digitize with your laptop's trackpad, you are some kind of hero. I find that to be incredibly painful to do. I don't like digitizing on trackpad, but I've known people who do. Believe me, that is not my method, but but it could be your method if you like it. Trust me, you do some stuff that I'm not used to. That is rough for me. So like I said, we've got some other options there. And it's I think, like I said, it's interesting to talk about why we do them, but cer certainly it really depends. Uh, we've got some other stuff going on here. We've got, Joanne says, sounds like an interesting topic. Thanks for all the good information provided. Thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for watching. Also, uh, Ramona says, started years ago with a mouse, moved up to pen tablet, now pen monitor. They all work. Yeah, pen display. My thing is I, I used pen tablet for a while and it actually turned me off pens. And we'll talk about that. Pen tablet being the tablet that's on the desk. Tablets on the desk, your eyes are up front and you're moving the cursor with the pen. I found that to be less useful for me. Uh, also, I'm going to tell you guys, I did print art. I did art for print or helped work with print art. And I was doing lots of Photoshop work, uh, work where I'm working into rasters, where I'm painting things out. For me, the pen was useful for that. Even the pen tablet was useful for that. But it, it always lacked something that pen display makes up for. Being able to work directly in the display is very much more like working on traditional art media. You're drawing literally into the art that's there. Uh, but I do still say that there's room for pen tablet, but I think pen tablet for me is where it kind of didn't work. It soured me on digitizing a little bit because the disconnect between my hand moving with the pen and what was happening on screen, and especially the smaller the tablet you're using, we were using budget small, you know, Wacom bamboo tablets, really small tablets on our desks at that point. Uh, it was a, it was a cost issue because we also burned them out. They wore out pretty quickly, believe it or not. We had issues with them burning out pretty quickly. Um, those tablets I didn't love. And when we're working on a small, you know, you're working on a, a four by four kind of field and trying to 
work on that scale comparatively. Like I'm really zoomed in doing details on work and micro movements on this little tiny tablet mean macro movements on screen. That disassociation between how far you're moving your hand and how far your cursor is moving, I found to be incredibly frustrating. But these days where it is more affordable to be, have a larger pen tablet and where they have more pro version pen tablets that are available for lower costs, then I think that there's more argument for that. In the days that I started, I stuck with mouse because the, it really, I think both, both the technology, it was expensive and it wasn't something that I found to be that useful unless I was doing things like I said, painting out rasters, Photoshop stuff. That for me was well and truly a better use for that pen tablet by far than digitizing was for me at the time. Once I started using pen displays like the Cintiqs, those made a big difference to me. And I have to agree that's a much better version for me. And uh, But I'm with Mike on this. Even with that, multiple giant screens, can't live without those. Yeah, I'm always on large screens and I'm always on multiple screens. And in fact, the, the times that I've really loved using the Cintiq or the other kinds of... Uh, pen displays, they're pretty big. We're talking about the 22s. We're talking about fairly large displays that I like to use for that stuff. Um, the Studio 15s and 16s, the 15, 16 inch tablet displays are fantastic. They are still rather expensive and it depends on whether you have someone who's providing that for you, which uh, I was lucky enough to have. Or if uh, you are able to purchase one of those, then it makes a big difference as to how usable they are for me. And that's kind of how I feel about that, right? And Mike, I think you agree with me on that one. Uh, I'd like to try a Cintiq someday. Non-screen tablet lasts about 10 minutes and went back in the box. That's the feeling I had mostly too. Um, like I said, it for me, it was divorcing the distance I was moving versus the distance on screen. And I'm the same way. Large screen up in front of me, small tablet. That means that I really have a lot of micro movements I have to do to make this work the proper way, or I have to kind of isolate it in a weird way. And I didn't like it. Now, I will fully admit that I probably didn't spend as much time setting it up as I could have for that back in the day. When I started to have larger pen tablets to work on, and definitely when I had kind of one-to-one -one movements, once I had a pen display where when I'm zoomed in, that I'm exactly moving where I want to be, I'm dropping points. Still very good. I will say, however, um, key combinations still kind of hard. Right click, left click, uh, left click still kind of hard because there's some weirdness with how you uh, toggle between those clicks with the pen. And they can be weird depending on your setup. You have to set it up to work the best for you and the way that you hold the pen for sure. So last couple of comments, then I'll get into my stuff on that too. So we'll see. Uh, Sally says, I use a mouse and keyboard shortcuts, but really struggle. I need to draw manual lines. I think I need a pen too. Yeah, it really depends because I'm also going to say this. I'm going to come out and say that I don't love using what I call the scribble pen for drawing. I would much rather do uh, the method when I'm drawing like Bezier curves. I'm generally going to drop nodes and then edit after I've dropped my nodes, or I will drop nodes and do a little bit of curve work and then go back and edit my curve into shape rather than use like the freehand pen, the freehand pen that just occasionally drops nodes as you go. I don't love using freehand pens because we all know uh, when we're talking about embroidery, embroidery is only ever made out of straight lines. Every stitch is a straight line pulled between two points. When we do small curves or fine curves, we're gonna get a bunch of extra nodes that are added by freehand tools. And on top of that, even if we're smoothing that out, if we get in the habit of drawing small little curves, well, we have to use straight stitches to go across those. We're going to end up with lots of little small straight stitches. So I don't love it for freehanding, but for manual uh, stitch stitch point dropping, I love it for that. And I think that really works, right? That's just kind of how that works. And that's, <laughs> it just depends. Like I said, it's not always how it is. I'm not always, uh, I'm not always um, doing the same stuff every time. I'm doing different kinds of designs. There's different reasons for it. But what I'm going to find out, find, or I think you'll find if you're like me, for me, the mouse is the go-to. I can always predict the mouse. And also, I used to move around between different workstations all the time. And just about everybody's workstation had a mouse on it if I had to remote into my digitizing software and do something quickly. Having the standard mouse and keyboard is always good for me. Like that's that's At least I knew that I wouldn't have to worry about specialty tools. The other problem I have is sometimes if we get into specialty tools, like uh, and lovely thing I was actually uh, given as a gift from my coworker, Jim, a... Uh, it's, it's a uh, gaming pad. There's all kinds of different gaming pads you can get for your left hand while you're using a tablet. So it's a programmable keypad. I love the thing. It's cool. However, then I miss it when I'm not at that workstation and not everybody is running around with a gaming pad or I have to carry it around to me and install it everywhere I go. And for me, it was always like, I want to be able to teach anybody on anybody's machine or use any machine with my software. And luckily with uh, in Brilliance with Stitch Artist, I because I can install on any computer that I own, 
I can take any of my computers without all of my hardware and digitize wherever I am as long as I have a mouse and some kind of keyboard and I'm comfortable. But I will say for ergonomics, it's not always the best. But, you know, there's still some stuff here that we can talk about. And uh, a few more cons, these are fun. Justin says, uh-oh, I still say Wacom. Yeah, so did I until I looked this up and found out that this was actually a debate. I thought mouse versus tablet was bad enough. Uh, apparently the Wacom versus Wacom, which is supposedly the right one, Wacom, is rough. So, yeah, <laughs> Wacom slash Wilcom. Hmm, yeah, I know, right? DJ says, depends on the design for me, both have a place. Yeah, same here. Same here. Absolutely. So uh, love that. Love that. <laughs> so he says, trackpad is like using Etch-A-Sketch. I don't think it's quite as bad as twiddling the knobs, but I find the trackpad to be really rough. And yeah, Mike, yeah, it sounds literally painful. I know people who do it, especially they're traveling around with their laptops and they don't have a place to sit down with stuff. Funny enough, somebody who I knew who did this a lot, they were actually... Uh, their their partner their spouse was a truck driver and they were traveling with them and they had started without having like a lap desk and they were sitting there with their lap and their laptop digitizing and they got very used to it and then kept on using trackpads it just wasn't really kind of my thing to do but yeah i loved it so it's i, I love hearing about it even if i don't want to do it right it's just one of those things and this is uh like i said Ergonomics is a thing, Mike says. But then again, for some reason, even my mouse gives me cramps when I digitize fonts. Nothing else, just fonts. Fonts especially. We're going to talk about that a little bit with the on-screen tools. Fonts are super geometric, tightly controlled. You have to keep straight lines. And even when you're working on curves, you're usually doing very precision work that you're going to have to be very careful with. And you're trying to line up very carefully with outlines that are completely clean and clear and specific. Whereas if you're doing something that's a little rougher, you don't have to have your point placement quite that perfect. Now, I'll say the other thing is what we need to get over that a lot of graphic designers do is I find lots of digitizers try to digitize things from the get-go directly over their work. They try and be very careful with point placement and with the way that curved lines look. They try and get the curve on the first draw. While they're drawing, they're trying to make their curve perfect. For my money, I'm just going to tell you, the best thing you can do is not worry too much about that, especially if you're using the vector style method, the Bezier style input, or even the spline style input where you can edit the curves. Dropping the points in the right place, then going back and cleaning up your curves is a totally useful way to do this stuff. And you can worry more about the point placement and not the curve. Go back and clean them up. Even if you're using full spline, spline placement, we're going to add more points to get your curve right. Drop it in. Don't worry too much about it. Go back in, add more points to get your curve right if you are using the vector style input. So if we're doing like ladder style left, right input, maybe not so much because that also sets our uh, inclination lines automatically when we're using left and right satin input, column style input. Um, that might be more of a concern for you because you're going to do that. Honestly, you're going to end up with too many inclination lines anyway. Uh, but when we're doing vector style input, worry less about that curve on the first pass and go back and edit. Give yourself the room to go back and edit. I think it really is useful for that. It's just it's just the way I think, honestly, when I've watched people do it, if you've heard me talk about this great vector artist and illustrative designer, Von Glitchka, go look up vector basic training from Von Glitchka. If you are using any kind of software, including cutting software that uses a vector style input, a Bezier style input, you can learn a lot from the way that he does point placement and editing. I'll just leave it out there. Plus, Let's say if you are on LinkedIn, you have LinkedIn Learning, which was formerly lynda.com. Or if you're like me and your local library, my local library has free access to quote unquote LinkedIn Learning. It was lynda.com. And you can go look up classes from Von Glitchka. You can go learn this stuff because luckily, if you're using vector style input, if your software supports it, not all software does, or if you're importing vector and adding stuff to it, it's not my way of doing things, but some people do you can go learn that vector style input. And I think that's, it's something that we can kind of talk about later, but go look at Von Glitchka's classes. And because Illustrator is much more popular, you'll see people drawing an Illustrator, but the methodology behind it is fairly universal to any kind of input that is Bezier style input. And I'll even say that just learning more about where curves break on a line and how to kind of place curve points or uh, cusp points or, 
you know, corner notes, line points on a line to get the kind of shape you want is still useful even if you're using spline-based inputs because you just kind of learn more about how those lines bend and how they work. So worth, worthwhile to talk about it, but still, it's it's a different kind of thing. I'm going to go ahead and grab cut last couple comments. We'll jump into it. Sally says, freehand pens take longer to edit out unnecessary nodes. I would have to agree with you. I don't love freehand tools. Some people love them. I find it to be just the hardest way for me to enter. Plus, I am a perfectionist when I'm working on a lot of stuff. I don't want to have tons of unnecessary nodes because I also find that when I'm editing something, if I need to thicken up a line, I don't want a ton of little nodes on all sides of the line if I need to do some manual work on that. It's not something that I'm going to handle through pull comp. If I want to change the thickness of a stroke, especially on letters, on something that's really, like I said, very geometric and precise, I don't want a ton of excess nodes that I'm going to have to move to get things right. And then I'm going to end up with what I like to call lumpy curves you get curves that have corners in them or lumps in them a lot of those having way too many uh, nodes makes that possible so let's actually jump in i know we're like halfway through our hour here but i love all the comments keep your comments coming we're going to talk more about that stuff as we go but i'm going to jump in with the slides that i presented when i talked about this last in a live class so these are the slides like i said with um from my class, it was about debating digitizing. I think it's a worthwhile thing to take a look at. Uh, at the very least, we can talk about how I usually handle the mouse and tablet pros and cons. And so let's just talk about it briefly. These are kind of my pros and cons for mouse versus tablet. These aren't all of the reasons why you might choose, but this is how I put it together for this class. And I think it still kind of follows what we've been talking about so far. Um, pros for mice you can get a very nice mouse that handles things very well that is very uh precisely handled handled that is it, it works very well you can adjust it it has programmable buttons all the cool stuff that you might want out of a mouse pretty inexpensively you're not into the thousands of dollars with mice generally you can have a very nice gaming mouse a uh, decent gaming mouse in the tens of dollars quite easily. And so the mouse pros, they're relatively inexpensive. As you can see, I often use regular old Logitech wireless mice. Um, same kind of argument I've had before. I like to be able to digitize no matter where I sit down and not feel like I'm missing something. So I don't like to use a lot of custom key combinations. Admittedly, the ones that have custom combinations where you have all the gamer keys on the left, uh, like under their thumb or something, um, Honestly, that's. I think that those are really interesting. I've used them before. I've used different combinations for uh, scrolling and positioning in the in the thing, or using uh, using special key combinations for doing your dragging and stuff like that. If you're panning through your design, luckily all that's also on the keyboard. So if you're used to keyboard cording, or it means you're using combinations of keys on your on your other hand, most of the time you're going to be fine with a standard mouse. If you're going to do that anyway, you can have that on the keyboard, and I don't think you necessarily need it need all that stuff. But you can, and it's still pretty inexpensive. The other thing is, and this is a weird one, but I really find that this is something I think about a lot when I'm using um, the pen tablet. It stays put when I click. Depending on how precise your tablet is, and if you've had a poor quality tablet, or if you're working on a tablet rather than a display, you may find sometimes when you go to apply the pressure of the click, if, you're, if it's taking too much pressure, or if you have a little bit of parallax between the way your screen is and your display, usually nice modern displays are not going to have that problem but you may see that you're getting a little bit of drift when you click or maybe you personally and let's say this is a mobility issue um, if you're somebody who has a little bit of mobility trouble maybe you've got a, a bit of you know shake in your hand that's something that can happen or if you're someone who has issues with um, like i said carpal tunnel stuff like that where you may have some issues with staying precise over time some people like the pen for those, but I find when I am tired, my hand may drift a little bit when I'm working on a lot of tiny little points. And I find that I drift a little bit when I'm clicking. Um, this is not always the case. It can be the case for you. I've got some hand issues when I'm tired at the end of a multi-hour session of digitizing where I get tired of also holding my hand at different angles. So for me, a big deal with the tablets, and I'll talk about that in a second, is having some sort of either an arm or stand that I can change the angle so I can either work over the tablet more, work into it, or change that angle throughout the day. Really depends on what you want to work on. But like, like I said, uh, for me, I find that it stays a little put better on click because the mouse just doesn't want to move unless you move it. Um, it is going to stay put while you're clicking. You can just kind of park your hand, park the heel of your hand, and your mouse is going to stay pretty uh, pretty tight right there. Certainly, like I said, uh, additional buttons in the scroll wheel. Uh, generally, when we're talking about uh, working with pens, they're going to have the two buttons on the side, and they're going to have the main click button, and you can assign those. 
but if you like the additional buttons, mice are just going to have more of those additional buttons available. And I use the scroll wheel for panning and zooming a lot. Not everybody is into that. I do. I miss that scroll wheel and use it, have, having to move my other hand up onto the tablet to use either scroll, there will be sliding scroll wheels or other control methodologies like wheels that might be on the tablet themselves or click wheels, or if I have to have a secondary keypad, sometimes I can take those down onto the desk next to my keyboard, but I find that the key, the keypads that are on tablets uh, sometimes don't have enough commands for me. Like I, I want more commands or I want the regular commands that are available. I can program them onto the keypads, but sometimes I'm not uh, fully into having to have all that customized on a layout that I'm gonna have to carry around with me. But that, like I said, that might be particular to me that I like to work on a standardized machine. If you're setting up your machine for your use and you're not moving around to different stuff, might be fine for you to go ahead and use all those keypads. We'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, sometimes I just like the keyboard command version better. It's also those keyboard commands are in are in your software, are in your manual, and otherwise you're going to have to spend time programming them onto a custom keypad or some other peripheral. Does that matter for most people? Maybe, maybe not. You're going to have to decide if that matters to you. For me, I just like to know those key commands wherever I'm at. And because I'm also doing education with people or talking to people about different softwares, I like to be able to literally tell them what key commands I'm hitting and not forget those and not have those be kind of an afterthought because I've got them programmed onto a panel somewhere. So it really depends on how you feel about that. Um, lots of people use these tablets and lots of them use them with the keyboard anyway, but I find the positioning of the keyboard, of a full-size keyboard especially, with the uh, tablet, with the graphical tablet, with uh, especially the displays, as we're talking about, to be a little bit problematic for me. I find it hard to do, or at least I never get very happy with how that is set up. So it really depends, right? Um, though I also, I'm going to bring up a comment since we have a very nice comment from Mike here. Uh, my favorite mouse trick is the ones with adjustable DPI. So dots per inch, that's going to be adjust, adjustable resolution, how, you know, how fine the resolution on the camera and the mouse is. So how precisely you can move, like how much movement can you, or does it take for you to move your uh, mouse cursor around? How much physical movement will it take? So you can get really precise. When I'm doing really precise, I can knock it down and get my placement perfect. So I love that. Love that. So that's one of those things too. I think it's worthwhile to think about that for mice, but there's a lot that's going on with tablets that's very useful too. So we're going to bring tablets back in. Like I said, I'm giving you a lot of pros and cons because I tend to use the mouse. That's certainly going to be something you're seeing in my discussion of it. These are what I think are my pros for me. And also, honestly, like I said, universality. When I sit down to a mouse and keyboard, wherever I am, I can generally do the same things and I don't feel like I'm missing anything. But it just depends on, on how you set things up. You can also elect to carry your peripherals with you, to always use your, you know, Wacom Studio Pro everywhere you go, and you'll be able to handle that. But like I said, it depends on who you are and what, what kind of work you do as well, and you may find switching back and forth is really useful. But let's talk about mouse cons. Sincerely, um, with the tablet, uh, the mouse is less intuitive for drawing. If you're someone who is drawing art, if you're painting stuff out on raster, uh, for sure the mouse is unintuitive for drawing. If you're someone who uses drawing uh, or who uses traditional media to draw, and that is a method that makes sense for you for making shapes, you're probably going to like the pen better. If you literally are someone who sketches and draws, I think that lots of those folks like the pen better as an interface, and that's totally fine. Um, and like I said, it really just depends, right? It depends on how you're working on each kind of uh, setup and each kind of design. Depending on what you're working on and how you work, you may find that it's just un unintuitive. And I found, even me personally, when I was doing more artwork, so when I'm working on original artwork, when I'm trying to, like I said, work on Photoshop to work on some raster, painting stuff out, mouse is not as good as pen for that. I find that pen's gonna be better for that. And if I have access to a pen tablet at the time that I'm doing that, especially pen display, I am more likely to wanna go to a pen display if I can for doing that kind of work. And also ergo friendliness, you're seeing here, I have a, I have a, a regular mouse. This is a regular Logitech mouse combo that's over here. And the one that's on the right-hand side is a vertical mouse, which I actually have sitting here in front of me, the very particular one that I was using. It's a fairly inexpensive anchor vertical mouse. These you hold like a handshake. As you can see the heel of the mouse there, my hand, my wrist is in a vertical position. And I'll go ahead and put myself back on screen so you can see it. Um, this is one of the options for that is to have this vertical handshake style mouse and you can see how that, that that's set up kind of this shark fin looking mouse that allows you to move from the elbow and the wrist and or from the elbow and move things around in that way and have your wrist aligned in a way that's not uh, quite so taxing on your wrist because usually you're kind of flexing your wrist in a weird way to hold a mouse flat 
Um, mice are just not as ergo friendly as using the pen, especially if you can adjust the way that you're setting up your tablet and your or your tablet display so that you're working in a way that you're not trying to hold yourself up. The one thing I will say I find people do on um, tablet displays that bothers them, and this is something I do sometimes, I forget to use it like a tablet of paper. I forget to use it like something I'm working on, like a work surface, and I put my tablet too far vertical and I'm working on it from the shoulder and I'm working on it way up in the air so that I'm really holding up my arm in a natural angle for a long period of time. People who've ever drawn on the wall, who've ever done murals, or uh, hey, if you just painted your house, you know, working for a long period of time with your shoulder up in the air will tire out that arm and that shoulder, and then you kind of just don't like that experience. You have to work on a pen tablet like you're working on a piece of paper like you're working, or at least more like that. You wanna have it further down, you wanna work into it, over it, so that you're working more like, like I said, the tablet displays are more like working on paper than they are like working on your monitor. If you're reaching up and working on your monitor, so the other thing I found is people with um, touchscreen laptops who try and use those for drawing, you may find you're tiring yourself out because you're working on it like a screen and you're pushing buttons on the thing up in front of you, up in, with your shoulder way up in the air and you might be less comfortable so the ergonomics are not as good so it really also depends on setup and you might be right frank says um i think i need someone to set it up until you're set up with it yeah i know that's that's how it has to be and then also um i agree with kitty here you can slow down to the tablet settings on your pc yeah um tablet settings you can set up custom settings and you can do things with um resolution and sizing and stuff like that you can i'm just going to say out of box i had a harder time personally getting those to work back in the day when i started working on them and setting them up properly for myself much better and most certainly better on displays and we'll, like i said i want to talk about that certainly more but it just depends on you know how you feel about that uh, certainly people have different feelings on it for sure. Number one, and here's my, here's my joke. <laughs> Maureen says your show is only an hour. I mean the first hour, the non-bonus time hour. I was already halfway through that before we got in here. Uh, Justin says, love a gaming mouse, programmable buttons. Yeah. A lot of people like the programmable buttons. I'm less about those, but I have gone back and forth. Um, on my dedicated station, I can, I can like them. In fact, what I used to do is set up also custom key commands. I would use, um, now I can't remember the name of it. I used a keyboard, uh, an open source kind of key command scripter that I used to use, uh, a hot key maker. And I would actually set up sequences of stuff. Back in the day, there was actually a period of time before we had key commands for every type of stitch type in uh, the software I was using. And so I would make sure that all my stuff was positioned on screen exactly the way it was supposed to be. I had all my bars on screen. And then I set up my own key commands to manually move the mouse up to the bar and click on the proper icon and then return me to my original position. I used to actually use a scripting software to do that because it was so useful to do that stuff. So really cool stuff that you can do but now these days most of your software is going to have uh, key commands that are useful keyboard commands are absolutely wonderful just recently i saw uh, lisa shaw talking about this in stitch artist where if you use the w key in stitch artist when you complete a block of stitching it returns you to not the settings you were just using but the settings from the object before that so if you're somebody who's digitizing something that's going between uh satin stitch blocks and blocks of travel stitching run stitching you press that W key and it will flip you and toggle you between those two sets of stitch types. That is incredibly useful and you have to learn that on a per software basis. But when we're talking about, you know, the usefulness of mouse versus keyboard or mouse versus uh, tablet, especially, like I said, there are differences between the different kinds of pen tablets and there's that. But I think that certainly it's worthwhile understanding, yes, keyboard commands, some kind of programmable button patch, whatever that is for you, absolutely useful. I like to keep it on the keyboard, but certainly, different kinds of uh, keyboard commands. Learn those no matter what, no matter what software you're in. Uh, Jenny says that happens with Wilcom on the space bar. Yep, absolutely. Um, there are also keyboard commands in, in all of the modern systems I know that go to different either stitch types or that go to different menus. Learn your keyboard shortcuts no matter what you're working on, no matter what you're working on. So, uh, and by the way, hi, Jerry. <laughs> I like to say hi to people. But uh, Mike says, I'm a lefty that doesn't even swap the left and right buttons. The rest of the buttons on the mouse are basically useless to me. Yeah, see, that's the thing. I, I tend to work on standardized setups. Do I see the need for other kinds of button panels and stuff? Yes, absolutely. I have used them and still sometimes do use them. For me, the biggest one is kind of when I'm on a drawing tablet, it is hard for me to keep a full-size keyboard 
in a place where I'm not having my shoulders at different heights and feeling really uncomfortable. So sometimes I'll use custom button panels or the uh, custom keys that are on the side of the tablet for tablet displays for my work. But I still find myself, because of muscle memory, I want to reach for that keyboard. And so for me, yeah, keyboard and mouse just became a thing. But it's what I, what I often say, and this is even with software styles, guys, the one you start on and you learn, sometimes you will automatically feel like it's better than everything else. Because whatever you start on, you often stay on, and the muscle memory becomes second nature to you. Um, confusing yourself by using a couple different systems sometimes can help you out, especially when we're talking about things like mouse versus pen tablet. There's actually very good reasons to use both. So let's jump back into the slides just for a second while we're while we have a chance. Uh, let's talk about mouse versus tablet. So tablet pros for me, super intuitive, especially when we're talking about graphical. Like I said, we're talking about displays. Tablet displays is one thing. So I'm actually going to jump out for a second to a couple things. There's different kinds of displays and stuff that are out there, and I can talk about different kinds of tablets, but here's the, the big deal. For me, the difference being between when you have a pen tablet, and we'll talk about this, this is Huion, this is one of the lower cost brands, slightly lower cost brands that people are using more and more these days. I mean, obviously I'm showing you like, this is what I often use, Wacom, <laughs> if I'm doing it correctly, Wacom. Uh, this is often what I'm on is like either a Cintiq, and as you can see, you get the pros. The pro Cintiqs get pretty pricey, even if we don't have everything else in them. So here's Cintiq 16, 650 bucks right now for a 16 inch. Trust me, you'll be a lot more comfortable to 24, but your wallet might not be. Though, like I said, I'll go back into this in a second. Um, certainly we have options from like Huion here, or people often talk about XP Pen is another one I hear about. So I'll just show it to you. I'm going to tell you right now, I haven't used XP Pen. I know people who have. I haven't used... Uh, a bunch of Huion stuff I don't own any currently. So I've only used some older stuff that is not what's sitting here right now. People really have liked the canvas line that we're showing you here. This is a pen display. But what I think the primary difference between these, um, yes, there's some resolution differences. Yes, there's some other stuff that's going on as far as um, you know pressures and stuff like that. For us, we aren't really going to use pressure levels. We can probably get away with, rather than getting the pro versions, we can sometimes get the non-pro versions of some of these things that are a little less expensive. Uh, however, um, like I said, it really, it really kind of depends on what you're working on. I personally find the regular pen tablets, these kind of tablets, harder to use. For me, I don't like these as much. They are less expensive. If you can get past kind of that disconnect between looking up at your screen and using the pen tablet, I always feel like I want to look at my hand too much when I'm using these for some reason. That disconnect sometimes bothers me. And especially if you can get one of the larger tablets. The very small tablets, I find hard to do the difference between kind of working on areas in my software. If it maps one-to-one -to, -one to the entire screen, and I've got this 24-inch screen and I'm working on this really small travel tablet, I find that to be a little difficult. Um, not everybody feels that way. This is my experience. Your mileage may vary. I'm going to say that right out of the gate because I know people who work on small tablets and feel comfortable with them. They adjust their, like I said, they adjust their resolution. We've already had people discuss how you can adjust how fast that moves your cursor and all of that. That works for you, then that's awesome. I find, at least for me and for some of the folks I know, if you can get a larger one, you're happier for sure. And that you still kind of have some of those issues with positioning the tablet in front of you and having your keys that you need. Because generally, these don't have as many shortcut keys as the number of key commands you're probably going to use if you're digitizing all the time. There's lots of key commands that I find myself using in the process of digitizing. And it is usually more than the buttons that are available for me to map on one of these. And so I'm usually adding some sort of key panel, some sort of command device, or trying to fit my keyboard somewhere around this thing. Your mileage, once again, may vary. You may be okay with that. You might be able to program the few buttons that are on these guys. Um, and the pro versions often have more button combinations that are available, or you can add a button panel or some other peripheral to this and make it work. Works for you. That's great. Uh, I would say, once again, watch your ergonomics on this and make sure that it feels good to you. But for my money, if I'm working with a pen, I'm most of the time going to want to work with some sort of pen display. So I'm going to want to work on something much more like, and we can just go, it doesn't really matter which ones, but I'll just go ahead and grab this 22 series here. This is the non-pro 22 series over at Huion. Yep, still 450 bucks, but hey, it, it is a pen with a display that works. You get um, plus series or other series, they may have more buttons, more features. They might have higher resolutions. You're going to need to go check because often the resolutions on these are about, um, I think these are 
Um, these have like a 2000 odd pixel size on these. There are 4K displays that are available. They cost more. The more uh, pixel density you have on it, the more it's going to cost. I've, I've forgotten the exact resolution on this guy, but there are different resolutions depending on what you're going on. But like I said, um, if you're lucky enough to be able to work on the Cintiqs, Cintiq 22, 24, these are fantastic to work on. They're quite pricey. They are quite pricey. The canvas, less pricey, uh, similar kind of thing that you can get. They have the pro versions. Pro 24 4K, you're going to be getting into the same kind of range as that, uh, as the Will, uh, the Wacom piece that you saw earlier. You're going to be have a very a similar kind of cost that's going to be involved. But there's also like these displays from uh, XP Pen, and some folks really love these, and these are a little less expensive. But once we get up into larger sizes, especially in the pro versions, you're going to find yourself spending quite a bit to get one of these guys, and it may not be what you need. But you know, like I said, for my money, my favorite experience of working with a pen tablet has certainly been working with a pen display. Um, doesn't mean it's the only way. Doesn't mean it's the best way necessarily for you. Yes, you're going to see a lot of high-end digitizers, artistic digitizers. I know there are, are guys who are out there who this is all they work on, and that's awesome for them. That's cool. Um, I'm here to say you can do similar work with your mouse and keyboard. Some people find the entry on the tablets to be faster. Like I said, super intuitive. Where you place your where you place your pen is where you're dropping your point, right? especially if you can get it in a position that works well. In this shot, I was actually showing it as kind of an artistic thing. So I'm not in a good position. I've got this thing at a book stand on this piece. So it's kind of just joking because I've got it with the magic eight ball here. But when you're actually set up, and if you look at this setup here, um, this is one where it's got a shortcut key panel next to it. This is that thing I was telling you about, the, uh, the kind of gaming peripherals we can add to put all of our short keys in one quick place that's close to the system. Um, certainly that's something that can be more useful, but what you're going to see is if you're looking at these setups here, this is on an arm. They're not that expensive, an arm that can hold this up and can be positions attached to the desk. You can also use repositionable, um, stands that have the ability to set your angle differently. And then you can even kind of move those around to different places. The arms are sadly bolted in stuck to your desk. So you kind of have to have those in one place. But if you're looking at this piece, that's actually a studio. Um, this piece is actually a computer in and of itself. It's an all-in-one tablet computer. So this one can go anywhere, but then I really do have to put it on some kind of stand. And you can actually find different kinds of stands to elevate those. Uh, and really, it's about setting the angle right and getting to a place where your hand is comfortable. I'm going to tell you that the angle you're looking at here is not a real angle to work at. This is just so I could take a picture of what I was doing for fun. Um, but they are intuitive. They can be ergo-friendly. Reason I put that little asterisk on there is that sometimes if you don't position it well, or if you uh, put it like this, like you're seeing here, you put it too vertical like a display, the way you're used to looking at a monitor, you're probably going to find that you're using your hand in a weird way and you're having your shoulder up in the air for long periods of time. You're not going to love it. So think of it more like you're drawing on a drawing tablet, on a tablet of paper that you're painting, that you're doing something that's more like um, a traditional medium, you might be happier. I mean, people paint on easels all the time, but let's say we're working on a small piece, we're sketching, working on a, a tablet, writing on a piece of paper. I think that's a better way to think about it uh, than to think about it like a display because I find some people who complain about injury or pain from these, a lot of it's in the shoulder and it's from working like we're painting a big mural where we're doing a lot of fine work and we might want to work into it from over the top. And I, like I said, your body is different. Look up ergonomics. There is an entire study of how these things should work for me working on it in, a, in the way of thinking about it like a paper tablet is a better method than working on it like a display and then putting my shoulder up in the air for long periods of time. Um, precise positioning, like I said previously too, uh, the reason why I say precise positioning is a thing here is that some people find especially if they're doing right click, left click, if your software uses right click, left click instead of keyboard modifiers to tell you what kind of node you're dropping, some people find that when they push on the click button, if they don't use a keyboard modifier instead, if they use the buttons that are on the side of the mouse, the pen itself, that that changes where their positioning is and they have to kind of get themselves into a habit of clicking on that first and then positioning themselves because otherwise they'll be positioning and then they go to do the right click over here um, one of the, the better options is probably to have that be a modifier where it is the the button click that is pressing down the tip 
and holding down the key on the side produces your right click if you have this problem. Otherwise, people who just use the button to right click, they're hovering over the surface and using the button to do the right clicking, they find that they shift that point a little bit, that they may find that they're, you're dragging to one side as, you're, as your finger presses down on the button. Um, not everybody has that problem, but when I've heard that described, I tell people, use the button as a modifier and continue to have your pressing down the bu the button to be the click. Just use the, uh, make the right click into a button press plus the point. So right, button press on the top plus the point, use a modifier or use a keyboard modifier where it's a key command plus clicking with, by pressing in the point and you have a little bit better position problem. So it looks like uh, Jenny says, I need to try that. That's a problem I have. Yeah, a lot of people will be holding the pen up and when they press the right click, they drift the tip out of alignment. And that's, like I said, if, if right click is uh, the modifier for you, you may find that's the issue. Um, if you're in Stitch Artist, the modifiers are actually on the keyboard to change what kind of a node that you're drawing and then you don't have that problem so depends on the software will come i know is right click left click for a lot of the stuff they do so that's going to be where you might have that issue and that's all about setup so that's why i put the asterisks on it not that it's bad but that it's something you need to look at that setup and see if that works best for you uh cons like i said if you were doing tablet display versus tablet uh just pen tablet on the desk they're expensive they really are. They're expensive. And if you're just starting out digitizing, I can see people getting disheartened when they're like, they're watching their favorite digitizer on a big old Cintiq 24 inch, you know, pen display. And they're like, man, that costs 2000 more dollars on top of what I'm already paying. I don't know that I can do that. Am I ever going to be able to digitize correctly? Absolutely. You're able to digitize correctly. You don't need one of these to do it. Are they really cool? Absolutely. They're really cool. Lots of people are doing work on those canvas units on the XP pen units and they're working for them too. Um, the one thing I've seen is that people uh, generally prefer the non-battery pens, if you can get that. A lot of the kind of the cheaper units will have batteries in the pens that makes the pens heavier. It depends on what kind of pen you have. Take a look at it. Uh, modern ones are not the same as they used to be. Back in the day, the off-brand pen tablets literally had like alkaline batteries you're jamming into the suckers. Those were terrible. They were heavy. They were not great to use. These days, uh, the rechargeable pens and things that they have now are not bad and they're light and, they, and the technology has changed. But I think that's something to look at is how heavy, how unwieldy is the pen. And also, by the way, there are people out there who sell grips. If you have ergonomic problems with holding a small pen, look at the grips that are available out there. A lot of people like grips that are, uh, funny enough, used for tattoo machines is one that I saw someone using. A big tattoo machine grip that they modified to go on their pen. There are ways you can get around things like the pen being really small. I've got big hands. Luckily, I don't have too much trouble with precision grip, but I know people who uh, don't have, you know, old man fingers like I do. They don't have spindly fingers and they like a, a bigger, chunkier pen and you can actually get something to do that too. So like I said, uh, cons on that, shortcut keys, pen keys can be a little less ideal sometimes, to, uh, or at least they require extra setup. They can be hard to pair with a keyboard if you like a full keyboard or if the commands that are specific to your software, if you're not remapping them somehow and they are on both the left and right hand sides of the keyboard. Um, there are people who use these gaming keyboards that don't look like the peripheral you're seeing here, but they are essentially like the left half of the keyboard because that's where most of the keys are or you can map some custom keys. Then they're easier to pair. Otherwise, trying to put a whole keyboard around one of these is kind of a pain. Um, and you, like you said, unwanted movement you can have from just the way you're positioning the pen and the way you're using the buttons. Thing is, I think that there's a lot of reasons to kind of um, view it differently. Some of the ergonomic steps, and I'll jump back on this one. Um, compact keyboards can help because you literally can just put them in a different place. They can be closer to the tablet when you're using them. Adding the large grips for sure and breaks. Take frequent breaks and set it up where it where you're not being in pain here, folks. Um, but when we're talking about the the pros and cons as far as digitizing. For me, I think that uh, I really do prefer mouse for most digitizing. It's going to be super uh, geometric and really regular on a grid. And I prefer pen tablets when we get into the more regularized kind of, or the less regularized pieces, the pieces that are more organic, working on fur and feathers and shading, that stuff I like to use a tablet, a pen tablet, or a pen display for. So it really depends on what's best for you and what kind of designs you're doing. Now, the other stuff I want to talk about briefly, and this is going to be kind of our bonus time stuff here. So like I said, mouse versus tablet. All right. We don't have to put it to bed here. Everybody's going to have their feelings about it. But for me, I'm still going to use mouse for a lot of stuff, especially working on font, stuff like that. But the tablet is really useful. My big question is usually actually this. Pen tablet versus tablet display. 
And for me, tablet display is always going to be better. Yes, it's much more expensive, but if you're having issues with pen tablets that are on the desk while you're looking at another display, those are often handled pretty well by the uh, addition of the tablet display. Yes, more expensive, but better to get that kind of um, direct feedback of having things positioned exactly the way you want them. So that's kind of that's kind of how I feel about it. You know, I we will get into this again at some point, but for me, it really is. I almost think sometimes it's genre based. It's like, what kind of designs do you do the most of? If you do a lot of organic stuff and animals and shading, you're going to find yourself probably loving that pen a lot more than someone who does lots of logo types, rectilinear kind of grid based stuff that is going to be very um, rigid. If your stuff is more naturalistic, more organic, you're going to like pens better. If your stuff is really rigid, you might like the mouse better. But it's also about the way you work and what is best for your ergonomics, for your body, for your hands, the way you work, and your history. Lots of people who use um, standard kind of art medium. If you're someone who comes from the world of making art in the real world with real materials, with pen and paper, you're probably going to have a different feeling about the pen that, that I do because that was not my original kind of inclination towards art. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about briefly here, and we'll keep it fairly brief, was this, uh, non-standard uses of on-screen tools. And honestly, I've talked about this before too, but I'm going to add another couple of things to it to kind of show you what I mean, right? So number one, some of these are standard uses, but not all. <laughs> we'll talk about that too. The thing is, I don't always use on-screen tools for what they are for, or I will use things that are drawing tools or other kinds of vector tools in order to give myself uh, tools that I need graphically in my digitizing. And let me explain what I'm talking about here. The biggest one for this is the concept of guidelines. When we're digitizing something, when we're trying to keep it very even, guidelines can be incredibly useful. And I'm gonna talk briefly about guidelines by bringing stuff up. So first, let's kind of talk about this. Regular guidelines are the first thing I'm gonna discuss. Guidelines are just lines that we can drag onto our, um, onto our tool pane or out of our tool pane, out of our tools onto our workspace in order to provide a, a line, a reference so that we can see where we're going. In this case, this is me working on a scan to create a font. So this scan is from an original piece from American Type Foundry. This is from a sample case of images or of these printed packs. And I was working on this font that I hadn't found anywhere as a true type open type. And I wanted to make a version of it. In trying to draw this font, if I decide that I want to make this really regular, yes, I can trace what I have here. If the alignment of my graphic is really good, if my scaling is good and everything is happy, then honestly, most of what I'm going to want is straight lines to make this work. So if I have straight lines I'm using to make this work, generally I'm going to be dragging some lines in. You can see that I have some lines here already. But the thing is, I'm going to be able to use these lines to kind of go across the entire row of text, and I can use this as a reference throughout my work. So you'll see that I can go back and forth and use this line to kind of say, yep, this is the thickness of these serifs of these strokes throughout the piece, right? So I've got this thickness throughout. It's going to be regular. This line is always going to be my top line. Clicking in and dragging a line in place is the great way to handle this, right? So number one, if you were here in Stitch Artist, and I'll show you in multiple ways, because they are a little different depending on the software you're working on, but still Stitch Artist, you can see how I'm over top of one of these numbers. You see how I get this little icon here, or this little cursor changes. I can drag a line from here and say, okay, I'm gonna snap this right here. And then when I go into other pieces later down the road, and I missed that one, um, we can say, all right, this is about that line where I have it on the serif for the A if, or on this crossbar for the A, and maybe I want to match that later. In this case, crossbar from the A doesn't come up as much. That might not be a good reference line for anything. I might not need it. So I can drag these out and off of the workspace and they're no longer there. But you will see that, okay, boy, that top bar on a slab serif font like this is really regular. That top bar that is the serif on this A that is the thickness of the top of that B, uh, the C, as we know, optical correction. So round characters are going to go above and below that line. And we can see these other top bars, they all fall into line on that same horizontal. So I'm going to be able to use that. Also, let's say I had to have vertical lines. I can also, of course, click and drag one out of the side here. So I can grab one here. And if I had vertical lines that are going to be either anywhere in my design, or if I want to use verticals to help myself get set up, I can drag those verticals off of the other side. I will very briefly just show you, um, it does work differently. Like say you're a Wilcom person, if you click, it just drops one in and then, it, and it actually, uh, the top bar 
clicking gives you one that is a vertical line on the left hand side that's going to give you a horizontal line and then you can position and place those whereas uh a brilliant stitch artist works more like a lot of vector software where you click and you drag one out and the top bar gives you the horizontals and the uh, vertical bar on the side when you drag those out and actually I clicked on one when you drag those out gives you the vertical bars. So these are guidelines. Those are traditional guidelines, right? And so traditional guidelines are cool. Those are very useful. They have uh, lots of uses we can put them to. Um, there are some vector softwares that allow you to set angled guidelines, but not as much. And we'll talk about that in a second. Traditional guidelines are tremendously useful and I've absolutely recommend that you use guidelines. They are useful for especially things like this, working on fonts, or let's say you have a logo that has type in it. So it's not a font, it's a logo type. And the logo has type that you're working on. Maybe the art's not great. Maybe you're working for an original embroidered sample. So you're working on something that has some jitter to the top and bottom. You're not working from a nice clean scan like I have here. These can really save your life because you'll be trying to uh, set yourself up for the piece and you're, you're gonna find that you can't really find the line or you wanna make sure everything's lining up correctly. Even if you're going to do things like optical correction, even if you're not gonna draw right up to the line, having these lines here will help you. Also, you'll find like on this print, either my scan is a little crooked or the print's not exactly great. We're finding that there's a little bit of variation from left to right here, but if I want to make this into a systematized font where I'm doing a font page and all the letters are the same size, I'm going to use these guidelines to say, yeah, I know the print shows me that I've got some extra space here, but I'm making a font where all of the strokes are supposed to be the same thickness. I'm gonna use the guideline to make sure that happens. Now that's a very traditional way to use these tools. That is not weird or rare at all. Uh, so that is just how these work. The funny thing is I find people not really using guidelines and I'm like, man, guidelines are excellent, especially working on fonts, especially working on logos that have, um, that have these very strict kind of grid based lines. Having these lines are going to help you. It's going to give you that reference. Even if you're not going to be looking at them exactly, you may find that even if you're not digitizing right to those lines, you can use those as a reference. Because even if I'm saying, all right, I'm doing this optical balance, I can say, all right, it swings about a half a millimeter past this, past the line that I have here. Every time I hit another uh, character like an O that's going to be optically balanced, going to be a little tall, a, a little bit above the top line, a little bit below the bottom line, I'm going to be about this same distance from that line. I think it's just a really good reference. And if you're not using them already, I really recommend that you do. Um, the other thing I do that is not as common is I tend to use other lines to help me decide on both sizes and shapes that I might not be able to see in my art. And that's where I use what I often call throwaway shapes. And we're gonna talk about this. Throwaway shapes are a big thing that I use in digitizing. Now, the one that everybody's seen me talk about before is this one. This is the heart of a lion jacket that I worked on. Um, I actually need to probably bring up the eventual embroidered file. Hopefully I've got that where I can get it for you. But yeah, if we can get the, the eventual embroidered file, I'll, I'll show you the final, final piece as well. Um, for some reason that didn't come in with this one. We'll talk about that too. We've got the Heart of a Lion jacket back here. This is the final piece, right? And in the final piece, I have all of these different lines that were here for these wavy kind of uh, satin stitch lines where I made all this texture in the back of this jacket. Now, I'm not going to try and bring up the final digitized piece. If you haven't seen me show this before, I have it online everywhere. I won't do that live, but this has a lot of texture and shine and the light shimmers over these rippled satin stitches. And I added these in, even though these lines were not clear. Each of these is an object, it's a drawn satin stitch. And the thing to show you about that was that when I got the original art, I'm gonna go ahead and hide all this stuff. The original art looked like this, right? And this is what I get questions about. How do you work into this art when you can't see what's going on? Um, certainly if I wanted to work into this art, you can see that I'm looking at these pieces and these all make sense as satin stitches. A lot of these thick lines and these points that are coming out of here, make sense as satin stitches. You would assume that depending on the size you're working on, this one was a large jacket back, that satins are the proper choice for these kind of these kind of uh, strips or ribbon-like shapes. And if I wanted to layer them together, that makes sense, I would want to bundle them together. And in fact, if we're looking at that, we'd say, all right, yes, I have a big area here and maybe I would fill this area, but it's going to be very flat. And instead of having that area be flat, I decided I wanted to carry the motif of these different curved satins that were going to be in these uh, open areas over here into the rest of the design. And as you can see in the final design, I do have that. I also have some other things split apart. Like you'll see that I've got these kind of um, split satin or auto split or length limit stitches inside of the ears, whereas I have ridges around the ear and these kind of uh, 
other segments here that are around the edge of the ear that have individual satin stitch ribs. And I think that's something that's pretty interesting, right? We can make texture with our blocks of stitches. We're using thread and the unique properties of thread to make interesting textures, right? And so how am I going to get that here from here to there? And this is where it is a little more woo woo, a little artistic, is that I'm going to actually work into this file with some lines that don't currently exist. And like I said, these lines are not here, but this block, if it was standard fill to Tommy through this whole block, it would look pretty rough. It's not going to make a good transition from all these satin stitches and fine detail work into this big slab of no detail here. And in this case, something I've showed you guys before, but I'll just talk about it briefly again. I looked up a reference image and this reference image, luckily it's funny enough. I think this was like one of the top re reference images on Google for lions and profile. Quite obviously, I think this person literally worked from this piece, very similar. Doesn't have to be that similar, but it let me see some fur patterns. And even though I can see why there was no detail on the back of this ear, because this person probably worked from it from this shadow, I did get a lot more information about the lines and the patterns of fur that could be there. And even though this is a very graphical take on this piece, it gave me a concept for kind of where all those curves should be. And this is where I use throwaway shapes and that I think are interesting. I'll just go ahead and throw these up here for you to look at. In the case of this particular software I was working on at the time, I didn't love the way it handled vectors, but it was really easy for me to use my straight stitch tool to draw on the design. So I looked at the original kind of reference material. I didn't draw directly on that. I just looked at it for some cues. Then I looked at the lines that were present here, like the edges of these other detailed areas that were already present in the design. And I went through and these stitches are not gonna be used for every, anything at all. These are just lines. As you can see, they go over each other. They got jumps and skips. They don't make a tremendous amount of sense. All I did was draw into the design with stitches, with lines. You could use vector lines for this too. In this case, I use stitches um, and I drew these lines in a color that I'm never going to use in the design. So it's easy for me to find this pink and throw it away later. You know, this is, this is a design color that was not in my final piece. And I drew all these lines in ahead of time before I started doing the final digitizing to give me an idea where like the edges of these parts of the heart are. I can separate where these different parts of the heart are. I can separate these different curls that I want to have present in my design and where the over and under kind of pattern will go for these different satin stitches. You're also going to find in the final piece that I changed my mind on some of this stuff while I was working. But what is critical here is just to think that you don't have to use the tools that are available just to make stitches. Now, in this case, I used a straight stitch tool because the software I was using at the time, drawing vector was Bezier and straight stitch tool was using um, node points and curved nodes were way easier and faster to draw. Drawing with points was way faster than using Bezier for me at the time. Uh, I've since got a lot better with Bezier curves, but at the time the software I was using, and certainly if I was going to use something like, let's say Illustrator or something else that didn't use node points at the time, or uh, it didn't use spline entry at the time, I would have had to do a lot of kind of more detailed work with curves, with Bezier curves to get this done. For a quick sketch, I just use drawing with points really fast. Now, these days when I do this, I would actually use the vector tools. I would draw lines instead. However, instead of using that, like I said, instead of using these the drawing lines, drawing vector lines, in this case, uh, I use the straight stitch tool and that's fine. Whichever way works for you, whatever tool works best for you, if you have shape drawing tools, if you have freehand tools, these lines are not for use in the final piece. These are lines for guidelines. And it's something that I've tried to explain. It's funny, people will come across this image and ask me, why did I put this weird pink underlay on here? And I keep trying to tell everybody, when I go to output the final file, I am going to grab this pink design. Now, in this case, this isn't a real file, but I'm going to grab all the pink stuff together. I'm going to throw it out. I'm not putting this into the final file. If we go look at the final file, there is no place for that to be. There's not a color grouping for this weird pink underlay. It's not underlay, it's not edge run. These are lines to help me digitize. And as you, like I said, as you can see, when we get in here, um, I actually decided to manually do a lot more work that was all about um, <laughs> really working into these curves in this kind of naturalistic look. Uh, I did not feather these edges, but I did add more ripples and curves as I was working them in. Uh, if we go back to our, our sketch file here, they're not here. These are just really quick curves to help me find where I want these satin stitch edges to be. 
when I worked the final piece, I decided to add some more rippling, some other edge work in here to just give it more texture when it kind of fingered together, when they all leaf together as stitches do in the same angle. I wanted to have a little bit more of these sinuous lines that followed some different curves. So honestly, when these feathered together, when they were ran, looks a lot better. It's a pretty good piece. It's, it's you know, it's a better look than a big chunk of fill. So I think that that's kind of the thing that people didn't get. It was a throwaway shape. And the thing is, there's that's not the only way we can use throwaway shape kind of work. There's certainly something we can do with that differently. But let's see if I can pull this up really quickly. I'll go ahead and give you guys also, that's the actual final piece. If you've been around me for a while, you've seen this piece because it's I find it to be a really good explanation of this stuff. There's all the satin stitches on the final jacket back that was done. Uh, and it was done kind of in negative and reverse, but we get this cool shine and all these ripples. And honestly, the stitch count was less than if it were just a big slab of full fill in this area. But what's interesting about this isn't necessarily the final piece for me. It's that we are using the tools in a non-standard way. Now I'm gonna go back out to the piece I was showing you earlier and show you something when working with fonts. When working with something that's really geometric, one of the other techniques I like to use is to use other kinds of throwaway shapes for scaling. Now in this kind of font, it's not going to be quite as useful, but I find it really useful on cursive and script fonts, and I'll show you that in a second, where we have different kind of stroke widths, and I'm gonna have a, a, a standard kind of thickness I wanna hit for the widest part of a font, of a font stroke, if we're talking about brush script or scripty fonts, and the thinnest strokes that I wanna hit, and I'll actually use shapes. I'll show you that again uh, on a script font. But in this piece, what I'm trying to talk about is this. I will sometimes draw a circle that is about the size of my stroke width here. So let's say I have a stroke width that I'm trying to hit. This B has a stroke width that I'm trying to hit in other places. I'll go ahead and say, all right, if the B has the stroke width, that's the width I'm trying to hit other places, I will make a circle. And then I can go on to other curves and say, all right, where am I hitting that? Is that good? Is that the max width that I'm going to use? In this case, on this particular font, not quite as useful because we're not having that same stroke width everywhere. And in fact, on most of these pieces, they have a thicker stroke width. So you're going to have to look at your font and say, if the font is very regular, if you're trying to achieve kind of a, a regular stroke width throughout, you can set this to a, a guide to say this thing is this many millimeters across. Uh, in the case of this particular piece, it's about 4.5 that I was looking at. But as you can see, it's not exactly the most regular from piece to piece. It might not be on every single stroke, it's the same width, but it gives us a reference where we go, all right, if this is the stroke width on the B, it's about the same stroke width for most of these verticals. If I want them to be the same throughout the font, I can look at this and say, all right, yes, that's about the width of that stroke. Yes, that's about the width of that stroke. And as I'm digitizing and working on a piece, especially something that's less regular than this, you may be able to use it that way. In fact, I'll go ahead and grab um, a different connected script that I'm using, and we'll talk about that same thing. So this is, if I'm working on a script font like this, and the original art was quite poor, I mean, the uh, art was not at all the way I wanted it to be, uh, I may find that these strokes are very different. And in fact, the original art I was working from had very, very poor control over the strokes. And when I was looking at it, I'm like, all right, I want to make sure that my strokes are fairly even, that the thickness, the thickest lines and the thinnest lines are pretty even from piece to piece. So I make myself a couple of these circles, right? So let's go ahead and drag these down into our font and say, all right, as I'm going through this, I know that my thickest part of my stroke, I want to achieve about this thickness. All right, cool. I can see in my thickest part of my stroke, I'm reaching that. If I go over here to my B, yep, same thickness. I go over to my vertical stroke, yep, about the same thickness. But then I want to have my thinnest part of my stroke is about this thickness. Yep, I'm a little bit over on the B, but feel pretty good about that. I'm just about added on the C. I'm just about added on the D. And I will use these shapes to guide me while I'm drawing. Even when something is irregular, I can then stop and say, all right, am I close? And yes, when I go to those thicker, the thickest part of the strokes, this one's a little thicker, but you also might say, all right, depending on the letter, I might want a little thicker. It doesn't mean you always have to be dead on. What it means is if I'm looking through this font and I've got two areas like on the front of the D and the back of the C that I know are supposed to be about the same, and I don't feel like they're kind of lining up the way that I would like them to line up, I may go ahead and decide to make them thicker, make them thinner according to that. And I can, instead of having guidelines on these curved areas where it may hit at different angles, especially on kind of brush scripty type fonts, you may find that it's easier to just go, all right, in the thickest part of this, yeah, we're hitting about the same sizes throughout. 
And you can even, if you're redrawing a piece and you find that it's really thin in one area, like let's say my original art, and I'm, I'm going to cheat and this is not my original art, but let's say my original art had this really thin spot in it. And I'm looking at it and going, okay, that's not really what I want to see on this part. As I'm drawing, I can go ahead and center this here and say, all right, as I'm drawing, I'll drop my points, even though it's not exact, on the edges of this circle. And now I know, even though it's different around the rest of this around the rest of this shape as it goes into the thinner curves with my widest point here when i back out of this design you'll look and say yep those stroke widths look pretty regular they look pretty even and it makes sense as part of the set right as part of the rest of the pieces so it makes maybe a little less sense on something like this piece here but when you're on scripty files um, having guidelines like this can help the other thing I, I have to mention on this piece is when you have something like this, this is a black italic, right? So black refers to kind of the weight of the piece, how thick these lines are and how tight these apertures are. But the italic has a fairly universal angle on it. And if your software, because drawing some drawing software especially will have the ability to set angles on some guidelines. You may have that in some uh, digitizing software. Often they do not. If you don't have it, you can draw a vector line that matches your italic here. And then as we go through the rest of the design, we can say, all right, that's going to match here, that's going to match here, it's going to match here. And if your lines aren't perfect, we can use this piece, this vector piece that you're going to throw away as a guideline to make sure that we're hitting all of our angles right. And certainly you can see on this scanned piece, maybe it's not perfect all the way across, but it is pretty darn close. And as we're making this into a font that's going to be reproduced over and over again, especially if you're doing something that's going to be an actual keyboardable font, or if we're on a corporate logo, like I said, we're working from bad source, we're working from someone else's scanned embroidery, we can throw these lines in there and it lets us kind of guess enough. So if this line isn't exactly on, even if we're not going to draw exactly to the art that's in front of us, we can say, all right, I've got the corner points from this art. I have the general shape of the D that I'm looking at. I've got my guidelines here so that I know how thick stuff's supposed to be on each particular piece. And then I've got my angle here so that I can tell if I'm at the right angle. Then when I go to digitize, I can make some kind of artistic choices to make it more regular and to fit the rest of the font style, the rest of the angles that are existing and that are there. Or I can decide that, yes, that variation is OK. And I kind of know where I'm at. I'm going to be honest and say sometimes you're working with a font, and you're going to find like you'll have one letter in a font that doesn't match the angle of the rest of them. This F has a crazy angle on it. And that is the original font. That is the original type source. So making everything entirely regular to the same angle on every piece isn't always the way you're working. But when you're on something that does have a regular angle like this, or often when we're talking about logo types where they've been designed on a grid, and a lot of them are, having the kind of grid mentality there and having this angle line there for you can be very useful. So when we're thinking about the lines that we draw, all I'm saying is you're not always drawing a line that's going to become stitches. It's not always going to be stitches. We can use those lines for guidelines. We can also do things like shaping, or let's take to say I take a couple of these and I have my circles together. And when I select both of my circles, I might be using shaping tools to subtract or add. And now I'm making this little moon shape. Once again, the circles were not the point. The moon shape is the point but I used two circles to make that point. That's the way that we do it in vector. That's the kind of throwaway we shapes we use in vector is we might add a bunch of shapes together to create the final shape we're actually trying to get. So worrying about what shape we're drawing is less important than where we're going to go. And in the case of using these as non-standard guidelines, we can also do things like, let's say we have an aperture in this P that's close to the same as the B. We might draw that little aperture and then drag it around to all the different apertures in the, in the font or the logo type and say, yep, I'm close to that same shape and I'm happy with that curvature. You may grab a piece and copy and paste. And I'll also say most certainly when I'm working on a font, if two shapes are really similar, this backstroke of that B right here, that vertical column is going to be the same stroke that I use in the D. I'm going to copy and paste it because that enhances that internal regularity in the in the font. But when we have a font that has some randomness to it, that has strokes with different angles on them where you can't just copy and paste elements to get them right, we can do things like use, like I said, the little size circles, we set them to the thickness of our stroke. And then even if that thickness is a little different or in slightly different places, especially on a brush script where we're not, I mean, a calligraphic script, that thick and thin is going to be dependent on the angle that we're currently at as we move through a circle. So it's going to be more regular on a brush script. 
um, the brush, if you were painting with a brush, lines can get thicker and thinner depending on how hard you press. So they're going to be in different areas. So it really depends on what kind of script, what kind of art you're working on, what kind of font you're working on. But what I really want to kind of just make clear here is that just because a tool is for one thing in your software doesn't mean you have to use the tool that way. <laughs> like I showed you last week, we talked about the stuff for uh, making those textured fills over the over fonts. We talked about that where I essentially used um, I used a stipple stitch to make a stitch line, and then I used a motif stitch on that stipple line to create texture. It's not an original thought. Other people have done it. Uh, certainly, they've done it with different stitch types. I, I hadn't seen it done with the motif method that I used exactly, but I most definitely found later people uh, sent me some articles of awesome people using different softwares to create, um, use that stipple fill to create a line on which they added, let's say, back stitching or other kinds of stitching. And there was more than one article that did that. But that's the thing. We all kind of come at these tools from different angles, from different kind of backgrounds, and use them in different ways. And yes, I should have to do that in a stitch methodology. So I can use these different tools to create lines that I'm going to add stitches to the path or add a fill to an area. And that's interesting. But we can also use tools in a non-stitch generating way, right? We can use throwaway shapes and the throwaway shapes can be used for guidelines that help us so they can be used as guidelines or we use those throwaway shapes to do things like i showed you uh, after the fact there where we grab those two circles we stamp those together we use a subtraction routine in our uh in our shape generating kind of a panel depends on what kind of software you have in illustrator everybody knows this is pathfinder and that's pretty universal but we use our shape panel to go ahead and punch things out to add two shapes together to make a new shape that works for us um, these things are not originally you know like i said they're not meant to be stitched as is but we can use those shapes to make new shapes to add stitches to or like I showed earlier, we can use them as guidelines. We can make angle guidelines. We can use curve guidelines. We can use guidelines to show us the kind of, like I said, the stroke thicknesses we want, the curves we want inside of a shape. If we want to replicate that curve over and over, we can use them as guidelines. And in fact, like I said previously, we can also use stitch elements or elements from other parts of, of the work that we're working on um, either to like I said, copy and paste the strokes from one place to the other. Like I said, with this one, uh, working on, on the big block of stymy black here, most certainly I was going to co copy and paste certain elements from one font to the next. If we check the, the outline on this and the outline on the uh, stroke from the D, they're going to be the same one and the E and the F. That stroke is going to be copied and pasted over and over. Uh, the other one I'm going to mention just briefly is when I'm doing uh, gradient work. You guys know when I do gradient works or shading, I will sometimes, when I'm lining up a gradient, I will use a big block of fill that I never intend to stitch as a guideline for where the stitches would fall on a normal single density fill. So when I'm lining up multiple layers of fills to make a, cu a custom blend of some kind, whether it's for gradients or for some other kind of blending of different colors of thread or different types of thread, I will literally say, all right, I've got four fills that are at one quarter density. They have four times the space between them than is usual. And then I will layer four of those together to make one fill. I will make a big fill that covers the entire area of my design and line up the stitch lines against that big fill and then throw that fill away. That is a throwaway shape that I'm using. I'm working into the generated fill so that I can give myself an idea of how those lines of stitching would fall in a standard fill that is all one density. I'm layering that together using the fill as a guideline. So we can use tools in the software for things they weren't necessarily intended for, and we can definitely use tools in a way that is non-stitch creating. It is non it is not a stitched result we're looking for. They are guidelines. They are throwaways. So either to make new shapes, to make novel treatments, or as guidelines to make things work for you, to make it easier for you to do the work of digitizing. And especially that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the Heart of Lion piece. Like I said, when I was doing the Heart of Lion piece, all of this area that was in here, the original art just didn't exist. And so if I'm working on that kind of piece, having the ability to sketch those lines in lets me go through the decision making process in my head before i start by the way i'm going to tell you i know people who print these things out at transparency levels that make them much they gray them out print them out on paper draw lines like this in with pens and rescan 
I don't do that. That's another Von Glitschka trick. You'll see he calls himself an illustrated designer or a draw designer. He will print out his vector work or he'll do a lot of his work paper and pen or paper and pencil and then print out things even as he's doing more work to them. He'll start out with that initial scan of a sketch, draw it out on vector, print it with some transparency so that it's nice and grayed out for him, and then add lines for shading, add other lines, refine shapes, scan it back in, then draw again. So you can do this with any mix of tools you want. Is it always going to be the, the quickest way to do it? No. For me, I found that the quickest way for me to handle this was to use the tools inside of my digitizing software, not pop out to some vector software, not pop out to raster software, um, leave that as it is, draw with either some straight stitch tools or the vector tools that are based in my software and use those as guidelines. And most certainly when I'm doing things, like I said, like working on these scripts, like working on the fonts, uh, dropping standard guideline shapes is just critical. Use your guidelines, use your stroke with shapes, do things that help it will help you make decisions quicker and help to make your fonts and your pieces look more regular and more planned out. All right. So with that, folks, we'll go ahead and leave the rest of the debates on the floor till next week. If you want to talk about mouse versus tablet, if you are part of the hashtag replay squad and you're just tuning in, by all means, tell me. Are you a mouse digitizer, you a tablet digitizer, and why I may bring this back up next week and kind of talk about what it was that made people decide what they decided on? And if you're a pen person, are you pen tablet, tablet on the desk, no display? Or are you a tablet display person? And why did you make that choice aside just from price? I'm going to tell you that's one of the reasons it really kind of holds people back. But yeah, I'd love to hear your pros and cons on that and what kind of tools you use for digitizing. And honestly, I would really like to hear about your use of non standard kind of versions of on-screen tools or just non-standard uses of on-screen tools, how you use those in a non-stitch producing way to help your digitizing be easier for you to do. Love to hear more about that. Do you use guidelines? Do you use throwaway shapes? Do you use anything else? And also I have all kinds of other weird non-standard tools I use in art. We might talk about that again later, but for today, we're going to leave it at that folks. What I'd like to recommend you do, go out there and use tools you're not used to. Try something new. Heck, if you can get something on a discount, grab one of those Huion or XP Pen displays and see if that works for you, because some people really do love that. If you're a display person, you're a pen tablet person, try the mouse for a while, see how it works for you. But try something new, use your tools in a new way, use some guidelines, draw some shapes you don't intend to stitch, and get out there and digitize something cool today. And by all means, share with the rest of the class how you got along. With that, folks, I can't wait to do this all again next week.